Thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Randall Stevens. We're going to be uh, spending the better part of the next hour uh, talking about automation and specifically I'm going to uh, focus on um, a part of the avail platform called stream and uh, we've made some updates to that recently. So I'm going to give you, um, a, you know, an overview and a demo of, of what the capabilities that are enabled there. Um, the, you know, I'm, I'm going to start out with the, the slide deck and then we'll get into doing a live demo. But, um, you know, I was thinking about, uh, as you can see on this slide, um, just thinking about that a lot of our customers and firms, I'm sure would describe themselves as being in the design business. But when you're, uh, when you get down to what actually goes on every day, uh, most all of us are probably truly in the information creation and curation business. Uh, and the reality of that is, is that we're basically creating lots of digital information, more digital information than we can, you know, can, than we could have imagined, you know, even a decade ago. And the reality of that is <clears throat> that, uh, which is where we've had a focus in what we're trying to do with Avail, is that most all of that information has continued to be stored in a file system, specifically, uh, traditionally a Windows file system. Uh, but uh, as we'll talk about, you know, that, that's starting to also change because of uh, introduction of cloud file systems and where all this information is being stored. Uh, but the, the, at the core of this, uh, we're basically creating all this information every day. It's what everybody's doing at their desk. They're opening up pieces of software. They're either creating uh, new pieces of information from scratch or editing existing pieces of information. and. Ultimately, we're generating all of this and trying to use uh, these traditional file systems as a way to store that. So that's really where we've had our focus with Avail is trying to understand the shortcomings of that and trying to fill the gap. So, you know, for those of you that are familiar, have sat in on some of our webinars in the past, you'll you'll have heard us talking about that, uh, and I specifically have always talked about the file system and the file storage, right, is the that the file system is great. I'll say great. It's adequate for storing information. There's nothing wrong uh, with the way that we store information in these file systems, but it's absolutely terrible uh, at the retrieval side of things. So that is where we've had a focus. Um, and I think this is important to emphasize because it, we've taken a we've taken what I would consider a much different approach to this. We are not necessarily trying to move content around, uh, but, but rather focused on avail being able to retrieve that content uh, right from, from, from the existing file systems and where you've decided to, uh, to store that information. So uh, for those of you that are, are already customers of avail, hopefully you've begun rolling out the 4.0, the, the latest, desktop release. There was a major overhaul that happened uh, back in the fall. Uh, uh, lots of lots of improvements to the interface. Um, that's continued to be a, a focus on the importance of the visual aspect of being able to, you know, not only search, but see this information. Um, and just a couple of, I'll, you'll see this when I pull up and do some demos, but, you know, we introduced a new concept we call channel cards. So again, trying to introduce the visual component to everything that we're doing, uh, just because we know that uh, most of the users in the AC industry are, um, are very visual in nature. Um, and so this is just very helpful for people to organize and be able to get back to their information. We also, um, of course, continue to have like gridded views of content like the uh, like detail libraries and this kind of information. But we did an overhaul to, uh, you know, what we call the preview panel now it used to be called the properties panel, uh, but just doing things like allowing high resolution previews of this kind of information uh, and, and letting people get back to it. The other, you know, for those of you that are new, somewhat new to avail, what uh, we've always had a view of managing content that if we were going to make an impact on the industry and, and really help what it meant to, to tackle this content management problem, we needed to be, you know, you'll, you'll hear us saying that we're content agnostic, which means, you know, a couple of things. 
One, <clears throat> you know, this is actually not that you have to read all this, but this is from one of our clients who shared with us all of the different applications that are in use inside of their firm. So, you know, the, the, the moral of this story is it's not just Revit, it's not just any one kind of piece of content. The content is being generated, again, at people's desks from all of these different applications and all this information is being stored in these file systems. So we've always had the uh, attitude uh, philosophy that if we were gonna tackle this, we needed to be completely agnostic to what the uh, underlying content is. Um, so we are file type agnostic with avail, but you know what uh, maybe wasn't clear or and but I think is becoming more clear is that if you're really going to manage content, you also need to be location of that content agnostic. So whether that uh, content's living on-prem on your local network or is now living in these multiple cloud locations. Uh, we've, we've always had the strategy and philosophy and approach. You know, we didn't do it all at once. That's imp almost impossible to do, but we've always had this attitude towards we've got to be as agnostic to where this content information is and what it is as possible if we're really going to uh, Try to make a con, uh, an impact for our customers. So we like to say, you know, we're not we're agnostic not only to what you're trying to manage, but you know, ultimately and maybe more importantly, where it is. And I think everybody's starting to see that, especially in the last year, as demands for where this content um, is being stored and wants to live is evolving. Um, the you know the other thing about being able to manage all of this information in one place and help users get back to that information in one place. You know, it means that there's fewer applications that you, uh, assume most of you on the, on the call today are in the management kinds of roles. So obviously there's a tax when you're trying to manage multiple systems. So part of being uh, agnostic and trying to organize your information in one system means that there's fewer things that you have to manage. But really, you know, when you, you know, when you think about the end users, you know, your users that are that are trying to now put this stuff in use, it's it's actually just fewer things that they have to learn, which is a big part of the challenge when there's too many, too many applications in use. Um, you know, this allows them to access all of the sources for information, and then you know we've always said that we felt like our strategy here created this kind of future-proof situation. You know, no matter what your workflows and the, what new software is coming down the down the road that you may employ, um, we're always trying to make sure that we can uh, we can support that with what we're doing with Avail. So it somewhat future proofs uh, your selection of of content management uh, solutions. So uh, so that's just a general overview for those of you that are new to Avail, kind of what our approach has been. Um, we're going to talk mostly today about this idea of automating and that's also been a big part of what we um, of what we think makes um, a good content management system actually work over the long haul is to try to automate as much as possible uh, don't have to tell anybody on this call that you know nobody wants to manually do anything and you'd like for it to just be a magic button and all of it um, everything just work and be there and, and be magic. Um, that's probably a tall order. Uh, but you know what we have, what we continue to concentrate on is can we automate as much as possible in this process? And what we're gonna talk about uh, largely today is a, a piece of the Avail platform that we call Avail Stream. And uh, that has been uh, a part of the platform since day one, uh, but uh, we've been making, continue to make improvements on that. and. I, basically encouraging our enterprise customers who that's available to, to, uh, to begin to take advantage of better advantage of it. So what is avail stream? So the way that we describe stream is it's, it's basically a rules based publishing uh, capability. And what we mean by that is that stream can monitor your file system and automatically get the content that's hitting the file system into avail you can manually index content into avail and, and that works uh you know works just fine um 
when you're organizing libraries and you want to get information in there, you can just drag folders or drag content over into a veil. But <clears throat> we always, um, you know, uh, since the beginning of this, I'd always say, you know, we're trying to manage relatively static libraries, but but things are dynamic. There is content that's moving around all the time and changing. And really where you're going to see us um, uh, putting more and more emphasis is moving uh, a veil beyond uh, just managing these relatively static libraries of content really into the deeper workflow of where information is flowing around your projects. So we've always had this kind of life cycle view of how projects are, um, are created, managed, and what the life cycle of those projects looks like inside of our customers firms. And you'll, you'll see that our dev cycle and the kind of products that we're creating around this are, uh, are following that. So we kind of started out trying to manage these libraries, but our customers are beginning to use Avail uh, to try to manage uh, much more dynamic kind of environments. So this is where stream really becomes important because you don't wanna to have to manually index anything. What you'd like to do is kind of set some rules up behind the scenes and have stream automatically make sure that that information is in the content management system uh, and available to you. <clears throat> so we just recently uh, had an update to stream, what we call stream 2.0. And the major, uh, besides just some stabilization uh, things around uh, the way stream works, uh, we added you know, what's called SMB support. Samba is the, uh, ac this is the acronym SMB. So SMB, uh, and, and we say general SMB support because it is a protocol and different uh, types of applications can uh, do uh, or implement that in different ways. So we've implemented what we call general SMB support. Um, flavors of this may vary. And obviously as it gets, as, as we're out there and in, encounter different uh, systems that are using SMB, um, you know, we may, we may run into anomalies. We, as we've done testing internally, we've seen uh, a variety of things, but we, we basically have general SMB support. So what does that mean? So SMB is, without getting into too much detail, is a protocol that lots of these cloud, I'll say cloud storage solutions use to make it look like that content is accessible from Windows File Explorer. So when you see things uh, as a drive letter and you're using Windows File Explorer to get to that information, that's because those applications have enabled what's called SMB support. So the kinds of brands of products that you might be familiar with out there, things like Panzura, uh, Moro Data, NetApp, Nasuni, these are all network attached storage solutions that are using this kind of cloud first and uh, synchronized to, to a local uh, file system. And then ultimately the users are using, um, you know, Windows File Explorer to try to see and get to that information. Made sense as people put these solutions in place from an IT standpoint, they want to support the interface that all of the users are used to getting to that information, which is Windows File Explorer. It's what everybody's traditionally used over the last 40 plus years to get to this kind of information. So, um, uh, so Stream now supports uh, that kind of information if that's uh, what you've chosen to use inside the firm, but also these pub, what I'll call public cloud storage. So things that you may be even more familiar with, things like OneDrive and Google Drive and Dropbox. Again, if you look at the way all of those solutions work, they tend to all use this SMB protocol as well. So anytime you open up Windows File Explorer and you're able to see a drive letter or click on OneDrive or Google Drive, these are all using SMB in order to do that. So the, the great news with our stream update is we now support any of that kind of information. If you can see it in Windows File Explorer in that way, there's a really good chance that stream's gonna work with that content as well. So. That just opens up again. It's, it's part of our strategy to try to support wherever you've decided that you want your data to live, uh, not just a Windows uh, file server, but any of these other types of solutions now uh, avail and the avail workflows around this are, are supported. All right, so let's dig into what does it mean? How does stream actually work and how do we think about this? So if you, um, the goal of stream was always that 
if a file hits the file system, then we think about that as being a signal. And that signal is that there's a file there, it's either been edited or it's a new file that shows up in the file system somewhere. Then we should be able to, with stream, recognize that. And then based on some set of rules, make sure that that information is gonna show up in avail. So if you think about that avail sits on, you know, as a layer kind of on top of the existing file systems, uh, that allows you to see and get to that information that lives in those file systems in new and more dynamic ways, then you can start to think about how would I set up what we call stream definitions to monitor those file systems and make sure that that information that's showing up in the file system also appears and is available through the avail interface. So here's an example where I've got, um, you know, traditional uh, file folders that have been set up and I'm, I'll, I'll pop this up and, and give you just a live demo to show you how this works. But basically, you can have a folder and then you create what we call a stream definition. And that's a, just a rule that says either look for a certain folder names or look for file types, uh, all kinds of ways that you can kind of create a rule around what you're looking for and what you're trying to monitor on that file system. And you create a stream def, what we call a stream definition. And what that stream definition will do then is you target a channel in avail for that information uh, to then uh, be published automatically. So rather than having to drag that information into a channel of avail, you can basically set stream up and a rule that says I'm going, I want this information based on this rule to automatically show up in the channel of avail. So in this example, you know, I had a folder that was called Revit content for review. And basically I wanted to drive content that would show up in that in that folder on the network, I wanted that information to automatically show up in a channel of avail. So this is a good example of, of building workflows. So you might have some QAQC workflow where you want people to put information in a certain place or you ask them to put that in a certain place on the network. And if you've set up a stream definition to monitor that, uh, you can basically automatically have that driving through avail as part of a workflow. So in this particular situation then, you know, this might be that only your BIM managers are seeing this information uh, and then ultimately they can open up Revit and be able to, from right inside that workflow of Avail, be able to see, curate that information, do something with it right inside of, of Revit. So all of that should flow, right, if you, if you set a stream definition up like that. So here's what that ends up looking like in the interface. You basically, you can think about, in fact, we've tried to mimic exactly the interfaces if you were to manually drag and drop uh, information into a channel. Uh, what you'll see is the series of steps you do when you create a stream definition looks exactly like that, except for you basically start out by saying, what is the target channel where I want this information to go? So in this case, I chose from a pull down list and selected the channel that I wanted to target. I can give this stream definition a name so that I can manage that in a description that all becomes searchable within avail as well. And then, um, you know, you can then target what folder or as you'll notice, we can monitor subfolders on the network. Do I want to watch? And what's important to understand about stream is stream is taking advantage of it's not sitting there and having to scan kind of actively scan for this information, it actually is tapped into the file system and it watches for the file system will actually tell stream when something's happened. And that way we're not sitting there trying to chew up cycles, trying to actively monitor things. We actually get a signal from the file system that says something's happened. And then we evaluate that based on your set of rules. So that rule will look like, you know, your next step is you're able to set up inclusion and exclusion filters. I usually counsel uh, customers to try to think about being inclusive instead of exclusive. So you're basically being very particular about what you're trying to drive and what kind of information you're trying to drive into the system. So you can see here that I can do things like, say I want you to include all files that have a file type of RFA, right, as a, as a file type extension. So this, you know, what this would keep is noise coming into avail. So if somebody accidentally dropped a JPEG in that folder or a PDF document, a, a stream would skip over that if you had set a rule up like this and only look for RFA files uh, that are hitting that part of the file system. So, uh, and then the last step of that is you can basically uh, continue to import 
uh, tags from the file system, uh, just like if you were manually dragging uh, information over and add any specific tags that you would want to all that content. Um, I'll also make, uh, and you'll, I'll show you here in the demo in a minute, but it also takes advantage if this is Revit content, it takes advantage of any of our file type handlers. So if you've already set up, um, you know, um, parameter rules that you want to come in off of your Revit families, Stream takes advantage of that in the same way and will drive that information into avail. So, um, so all that, you know, that that's the way that you can think about uh, setting up a rule to drive information that's on the file system into avail directly into a channel. It's great for, you know, like if you've got your Revit libraries set up and you just want to monitor that entire folder structure and drive that into your customer, your user facing uh, kind of channels for avail. All that means is if I added another family over there in any of that file structure, it'll automatically show up for the user. So it's really hands off and making sure that that information uh, is flowing and really, you know, trying to lighten your burden. You should just be concentrated on creating that information. And if that information hits the file system and matches this set of rules that you've set up, it'll automatically show up in avail. So uh, we've had a lot of customers use this to great success. Some customers, even 100% are using stream no information ends up in avail if it didn't get picked up by stream and some set of rules. So when we go beyond though, uh, you know, just stream, you can think about combining this capability to start to build out and drive some workflows. So uh, stream is an important part of that to automate that, but you can also think about channels and the way that you might set up channels and the way that you're driving this information around for channels to actually build build workflows. We also have, you know, flags and comments that you may be taking advantage of that can be a part of that. And then we also, because we support indexing URLs, uh, part of your workflow and the way that you've got your users uh, interacting in these workflows could be to have them filling out forms, request forms. We have a lot of customers doing things like that, but all of these, you know, what we think about with what we're building with Avail is trying to build a core set of building blocks that combined let you customize this to your own very specific needs. It makes it very adaptable. It means that you can begin to start to um, think about using Avail in different ways, not just for managing these libraries, but, but starting to drive and support uh, driving of some very specific workflows that, that you may be trying to work on. So another example, uh, just to, to, to think through from that first example, where we built a stream definition and we're driving that up into a QA, QC process that you then were looking at in Revit if you were the BIM manager trying to QA, QC that content. But you can also go another step further in thinking about this as a workflow and thinking about that when you've you know, reviewed that content and then you are ready for that content to actually be available to your users, you can think about moving that content from a folder on the network that was for review. And then once you've QA, QC'd it and done some work on it to I always say physically, digit, even though it's a digital file, physically moving that from one folder on the file system over into the library, right? Officially that you're using. So you can think of then about setting two stream definitions up, one to watch the submission folder and driving that into a channel of avail that's meant to support a QA, QC workflow that only your BIM manager or whoever's managing that, uh, that process sees. And then when they're, as part of their workflow, they move that from that place on the network over to, I'll say the public facing, your user facing side of the network. And if you set that stream definition up and that hits the network, then now all of a sudden that is now being made available to your end users as part of their standard library channel and things like that. So it, you can start to think about setting up some very powerful kinds of workflows, um, uh, workflows around this. Um, so I'm gonna take another drink of water. Gonna, let's uh, go into a live demo of how this works. I did, I forgot to say at the top of the call, I've got my colleagues, uh, Todd Trivasano is on here. Uh, if you've got questions about this, feel free to put them into the chat and uh, we'll leave some time here at the end to uh, start to answer questions uh, that you might have. 
All right, so what I'm gonna do is do a couple of things. I'm gonna bring a Veil uh, desktop over. Uh, we're gonna use this and I'm gonna do a couple of Windows File Explorer windows over here. So what I've done is I've here on the network, I've set up just a projects directory. And one of the reasons I did this is it's really powerful if you think about that we can monitor subfolders. So if you, you know, you've got your library, uh, kind of library assets part of the network. But if you start thinking about where your project data lives, it usually looks something like this, right? You've, everybody's got some high level folder structure where it's a project name or project number. And then within those uh, directories, you're gonna have some, you know, hopefully some standardized ways that you're used to putting information. So I've just created some simple samples here. You can see that I've got a, you know, maybe for every project, if new families are being created, you ask the users when they've created those families to put them in a, uh, in a specific folder as part of that project. I've created a photos uh, subfolder here, and maybe you've got like red lines uh, where you're doing red line uh, PDF documents or something that shows up uh, from maybe a blue beam workflow. So I've just kind of set that up. Some of these don't have those uh, all the, the same, the photos folders, but I'm gonna use this as an example. And you'll, you'll notice that all of these are blank right now. There's no information uh, that's sitting in these. So I'm gonna use this as my kind of demonstration of how this works. This other, um, these other folders, if you'll notice, are actually here on my local machine. So I've got a couple, some PDF documents. I've created just a couple of really uh, visual um, uh, PDF documents just with different colors and names on them there uh, to use. But if I back out, right, got a couple of photos that I'll use. Here's some Revit files. I've got some RFA and including some uh, folders with a, um, with a uh, type catalogs that are associated there. So I'm just going to, I'm going to start out. And so let's go now over to, uh, to the Avail desktop. So I've basically created three different uh, channels within Avail. One, I created a Revit family submissions folder. So if the idea was that you wanted people to drop those uh, new families over into a folder, maybe underneath every new project that you've spun up, or it could be one centralized place on the on the network that you want those to, to be uh, submitted, or it could be both. You can actually monitor multiple places on the network at the same time. I've created a uh, red lines PDF um, uh, channel, and I've got a photos channel. As you'll notice, all of those are blank right now. So what I'm gonna, the first thing I wanna do is just show you that if I were to go over to this first project and go into the new families folder, and let's just assume that somebody's created one of these new door families and they drag and they basically put that in that part of the network. So all, all that they had to do was put the file there. And then what I've done in, uh, in stream, right? If I go over here and look to where these, these are all stream definitions. So if I look, I've got my stream demo Revit family submissions. I'll just pop that up real quickly and show you that I've targeted that channel that I just showed you. I gave it a name. I'm telling it which part of the network to monitor and to watch the subfolders that are happening. So I chose my directory structure to be all of my projects. So you can imagine pointing stream at the very top level of a folder structure that where you've got all of those projects. And then, you know, what's important here is I'm able to set up some rules and say, I don't want everything showing up. I want to pluck out basically I want folders that exactly match the word new families. So if you've templated your setup of your directory structures in this way, which most firms probably have, uh, then you can say, look, only look in these folders and I only want you to pull out file type RFA. But if you look, you've got a lot of ways that you can kind of set up these kinds of rules uh, and what your, uh, you know, how you want to set those rules up to look for content across what may be a lot of projects or a lot of information. And then ultimately, uh, you can decide if you wanted to add some tag to that, but I want to import the folder names. So I'm just going to cancel that uh, and now go back. So if I go, uh, if I go into that, uh, that channel, what you'll see is that there's that double flush, right, RFA file that shows up. It picked up, it used the file type handler to pick up any uh, of the parameters that I wanted to come in off of that file. 
So uh, let's just do this now. Let's do another one in real time so that we can see this. So just to show that I, so let's take this barn door and I'm gonna put it over in the same location. So I'm gonna hit, I'm just gonna keep hitting refresh right here on the screen. And what you'll see is it takes a few seconds for stream to pick that signal up that that hit and the file system tells stream. And then within a few seconds, right? That new file shows up. So completely hands off, right? So where we're really trying to help you guys is by setting these sets of rules up so that this is automatically in the system. I, there's a new blog post that I just, uh, that I think we just put out yesterday that you can go and read. You know, the thesis uh, of that blog post was that a lot of times these kinds of systems fail because people go in here looking for information. Obviously that's where you're hoping that they're gonna go look and they go looking for it and they can't find it. What you're trying to avoid, the reason that these systems fail is people go looking for it, they think it's supposed to be there and there's no way they can't find it, can't find that information. So that can be because it doesn't have good search information or it's not named what they thought. But a lot of times that can also be because somebody forgot to go put it in the system. So that's really where we're trying to, to make a major change on this is it shouldn't, it'll be in the system if you've set these kinds of rules up and you're using stream uh, to do these kinds of things. So you'll also notice that down here below that it is picking up those folder names. So if those were project information, that all becomes searchable now off of which project this came out of and uh, any of that kind of folder level uh, information that you wanted to, to be able to show up. So just to kind of, if I go now to say the, um, another one of these project folders, let's do a couple of things. One, oh, sorry. So I'm gonna go now to this other folder. Let's just say that I accidentally drug that folder over into the root of this instead of where my new families were supposed to be. So, you know, that shouldn't meet the criteria for my, uh, for my rule. So now if I give this a few seconds, shouldn't show up because it doesn't meet the rule. It's, it needed, I set that rule up to say only look for RFAs that are in a folder called new families. So that is not gonna meet that criteria, doesn't show up. So if I finally move that folder over into the new families folder, even though I've created a new folder in there and I've got also that type catalog, now when I refresh, right, and give it a second, there that finally shows up, refresh, all of my metadata came in. You can see that the new project uh, directory came in. Uh, there's a keyword double glass door that picked up off that folder name that came in. So all of that information, more, you know, maybe just as important, if I go back to say the project one, two, three, and I go and delete that barn door from the file system. So I'm actually gonna delete that and it no longer exists and I refresh avail, you're gonna immediately see that there's a, you know, it looks like there's a broken link because that content doesn't exist. But again, as soon as avail kicks in, it's not only adding content, but it's also removing content if that's been content that is trying to monitor. So there you can see that it finally left. So, so it's the act of the content being there, meeting the rule. And if, you, if it's uh, moved, it'll also do that. It'll also pick up on name changes. So if you've on the file system, you know, change this change name of the file itself, Again, you can think about that being the path to the file. So it's gonna be broken in, in avail immediately, but give it a few seconds and stream will recognize that that file uh, changed. And now it's gonna adjust that in the, in the file system. So uh, trying to support everything that, that could be going on there and trying to automate as much of this as possible. So, so let's look at um, another example then if I were to go uh, push things like photos uh, into this folder. Let's go over to my demo photos. Again, I can drop a photo into there. And my photo rule that I had set up was, oh, that's the wrong rule. Stream demo photos that I'm gonna target the photos uh, channel. I'm gonna, again, target that high level of all my project directories. 
And here you can see that I said, I want you to include all folders that are exactly are called photos. And it has to be either a JPEG or a PNG that I want you to include as a file type. So again, this is a way to explicitly filter out and not get noise that you're not expecting to be in there. So if somebody accidentally dropped a file type uh, that wasn't supposed to be in the uh, photos folder, you can try to keep that out of, uh, out of the system. So, uh, so if I go over to that um, channel, there you can see that that photo is now showing up. Again, it picked up the, uh, the project name off of the file system and all of that is gonna work just fine. Same for things like PDF documents. So if I was over here with some PDFs, here's my PDF file one, but I'm gonna go outside of that folder and accidentally drop PDF file two in here. And what I should see is that in my red lines PDF, because I had explicitly said, I wanna monitor the red lines folder, the PDF sitting outside of that folder system doesn't get registered. But if I were to take that and move it over to say another project, red lines folder. I think you just copied the file name accidentally. Sorry. Good catch. There we go. Oh, sorry. Let's cut and paste that. I'll move it over into this project. All right, so now it shows up there. We give stream a few seconds. And there it finally shows up. So, and I can filter out by that project number, project name. So um, a very powerful, uh, you know, I think from, from that standpoint and takes a little pre-thought and we usually encourage people to kind of baby step your way, kind of very specific implicit rules because you can imagine if you pointed stream at all of the files right that you can get just a lot of data being driven into the system so it's better to kind of take this very kind of explicit um explicit uh, approach to doing that so um let's uh let's go ahead todd i don't know if anybody's got any questions and open this up for any questions that we might have and then i'm gonna i'll talk if we've got some extra time, I'll uh, tell you some of the other new things and maybe show you a couple of sneak peeks of things that are going on. Yeah, we had a question come in from Craig. He asked, um, does Avail know if content was added by stream versus manually added into a channel? That is a really uh, good question. Uh, one way that you can, you can do that is to, um, when I set the rule up, for the stream definition, let me go back to, so when I am setting up the stream definition, let's just go back to like this photos. What you could do is here say, added by stream, right? So this would only be a tag basically added to that content that was being driven in by the stream definition. So that's one way to accomplish uh, what you're asking. Um, we are working uh, kind of diligently behind the scenes to do a better job of identifying where, how information got into Avail. Was it manually added? Was it came in by stream? You're gonna see us as we open up Avail's APIs, you can start having information coming from lots of different sources. So we're, one of our goals is to begin to make sure that when the information comes in, that we know where it came from and ultimately expose that to you so that you can know how that how that information got into the system. So not quite there yet with all that, but there are some workflow strategies like what I just showed you for being able to do that. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but also stream only monitors the content that it it adds. So if if content was added manually to that same channel, stream is is not going to be monitoring that so no it's not it gets a little it gets a little complicated because because avail does let you you know you don't have to you could manually put information into the same channel that you've got stream driving information into you have to be a little bit careful because it can get confusing about how the information ended up there if you're manually adding stuff and 
driving automatic, automatically doing it with uh, with the stream definitions. Um, and, but that's again, all the more important for us being able to help you filter out which of this information came in from stream, which didn't and those types of things. So uh, we're continuing to try to, to try to, you know, knock those add new features and capabilities that are gonna let you uh, more easily uh, kind of filter those kinds of things out, so. And we had a question from Aaron and we might need a little extra clarification here, but the question is, can I use stream to add unmodified or you know existing content to a new channel? Sure, you can, uh, you can create a brand new channel. You can go set a stream definition up, point it to like an existing directory structure where information is. So I think what you're getting at, everything I was showing was I'd already set the stream definition up and I, I basically put a new file on the file system and that triggered it to show up. When you initially create a stream definition and point it to a directory structure, it'll scan that directory structure based on that set of rules. So it's not like the files have to be, you know, the signal doesn't have to be that it got moved there or that it just hit the file system. When you first create your stream definitions, it'll actually scan that directory structure to see if any file met that. And then from that point on, it's watching for anything new that meets that definition. So that's probably why that was not clear, um, but, but for sure, you can just point it at existing library structures and it'll, it'll go to town. And then uh, next question, let's see here. Sorry, they're adding some amendments on the fly here. So, um, so does content added to a channel, um, which stream has added, um, which was uh, previously enhanced with like the virtualized thumbnails feature. Does that automatically get that virtualized thumbnail also? Um, if you had virtualized the thumbnail, yes, it should, because as long as the content hasn't been edited, it will do what we call hash the same, which means in avail, um, it should look the same and and use that same virtualized thumbnail. What we haven't done yet and is we're working on is stream right now will not automatically virtualize thumbnails, but we're working to add that capability. So you could imagine if you were driving content into a veil, you may want that stream definition to say, I want you to also automatically virtualize the thumbnails of these files. The reason, one of the reasons that that's a little bit complicated is that wherever you're running stream from, that's actually where we're, we're indexing or pushing the data from. Thumbnails from files gets really tricky because if the, the place where you're running stream doesn't have the file type handler installed, then it can't get a thumbnail from the file. So you can think about if that was on a machine that you're running stream centrally and Revit wasn't installed, stream doesn't, the, 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 the file type handler for Revit family files has not been installed on that machine. Stream can't, doesn't know how to get, the underlying file system does not know how to get that thumbnail out of that RFA file. The first step you're gonna see is knock out are images. So uh, you can imagine it's much easier for us to get a JPEG or a PNG it is the image that we can do that. The way around that is that you could go just install the preferred piece of software on that machine, Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, whatever that was. You don't even really have to usually license it or do anything other than just install the software so that file type handler gets installed. But it does, it creates some complexity on our side about, hey, I can't guarantee that we can get a thumbnail from the file if the file type handler hasn't been installed before. So. That may have been more than more than you bargained for, but that's uh, those are some of the complexities of, 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 that we have to try to figure out how to best manage. No, just a question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on clarification. <clears throat> uh, can anybody create, uh, or, or basically, who has access to stream? What what permissions are needed for that? Yep, good question. Uh, two things. One, stream is available as part of our enterprise customers have access to that. So if you're an enterprise customer of ours and aren't taking advantage of it, you should contact Todd and set up a time to try to get that installed and get you 
you know, acclimated to how that works. Do you have to be a publisher in Avail, publishing privileges to see and set up stream definitions? So I keep opening up this pop panel. If you're not a publisher, you will not see this stream uh, option. And obviously if you are, when you click on that, you'll also see that you can actually, uh, there's a serve, we've got multiple stream servers set up here inside the office. One of them, it shows is not currently active. This is the one where I'm doing my demos from. It is active and here are all the stream definitions associated with that location. So you can also be a customer that might have multiple locations around the world country or the world, and you can actually run separate stream servers in different places and see those showing up here. And then you can have different definitions depending on those different locations of uh, how you're monitoring and what you're trying to do. So. And that's the questions that we have so far, so. Okay, we'll keep thinking. Let me show you a couple of things since we got a few minutes. This is our uh, kind of roadmap that we continue to update and share. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've been starting to get the APIs uh, ready for public consumption. The thing that's been uh, kind of real exciting, and I'll show you here in a second what this looks like, but we've been working hard since really last summer on a new feature called Harvest. It's actually an update to a, a feature we have called Harvest, which helps to manage Revit information inside container libraries or RBT project files. So I'll show you here in a second. Uh, but that's actually gone into um, what we're calling a preview release. So we released that to existing enterprise customers or invited them to participate in this kind of next phase of that. And we've had just great participation so far, but I know that there's still a lot of uh, customers who haven't. Uh, started looking at that. We're, we're going, we call it a preview release because we've still got, we're trying to finish up some work on it, but it involved, we wanted to get our customers involved as much as possible and help us give that feedback uh, so we could tighten that development cycle. Uh, if you haven't, if you didn't sit in on the first webinar that we did a couple of weeks ago, we're actually going to repeat that um, next Tuesday. What's today? Today's Monday. Next Tomorrow. Tuesday, the Next Tuesday. 16th. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, you, if you're a customer, an enterprise customer, watch for an email. And we're going to be sending an email out with the um, exact date for that and invite you. We'll explain what it is. I'll show you here in a second, just a little brief demo. But, um, and then we'll give you access to it and you can start uh, helping us kind of nail down the kind of last to do's on that front. Uh, we've also been working uh we're working on a concept called lenses which i won't go into too much detail but we've actually made quite a bit of progress started making progress on these connectors so i'll show you here in a second i'll pop this up i'm actually running this preview release and we've actually already added a couple of um, of those connectors in to onedrive and google drive and i'll just give you a quick little example here of what that looks like so if i go back to my avail desktop Let's go full screen here. So I'm going to show you a couple of things. One is this is content that uh, kind of the goal here was how to manage drafting views in, in, in a container library, a centralized RBT file where you might be managing all these drafting views. What the new harvest capability is doing is letting you what we call virtualize those elements out into a veil but still keep the source inside of that container file that's being used uh, to manage that information. So the nice thing about doing this is two things. One, it frees this up to look like they're individual files when, they, when a user sees them in avail. It lets you drive the workflow so you can copy and move from channel to channel. You can add tags. You can do all of the kind of workflow things that you wanna be able to do inside of avail. But if I had Revit open and I touched this, um, I don't have it running right now, but you'd basically in the Revit browser, just see that single detail. And one of the really cool things is you can actually now just drag and drop right out of this desktop, say onto a sheet in your Revit project. Other things that this is letting you do, if I open up our preview panel, is you've got very high resolution previews that were generated as part of the pre-process uh, of creating this content information. So. Uh, very cool there, but it doesn't just stop with uh, like drafting views. If I go over 
and show you, you know, we're, we're managing, we're able to handle drafting views, families, system families, legends, schedules, sheets, all of this kind of information uh, that you might be trying to standardize. So here's an example, right? If I've got a sheet that I'm now managing, and again, a user could actually pluck this out of the container file right over into a project. Uh, but you can also see that it's allowing us to deliver kind of very high resolution previews that you can zoom, you know, it's legible enough. And, and the kind of really nice thing about this is for somebody to do this inside of Avail, they don't even have to have Revit on their machine to be able to see this kind of information. So even though this information, you know, was coming out of a Revit file, uh, we're basically abstracting that information out and uh, giving you high enough resolution views as part of the workflow uh, for this. But if I went and opened up Revit right now, I could drag and drop that sheet right out of the Avail desktop or use it to uh, interact with the Avail browser right inside, of, uh, right inside of Revit. So that'll work with, like I said, views, sheets, schedules, groups, all these different element types that we're loading. Here are some uh, system families uh, that have been harvested out of, uh, out of an RTPT container. And you'll notice that if I mouse over these, there isn't a file extension. So these are all referencing back to that one centralized uh, Revit container file. So it makes it really easy for you all to manage this, but it makes it really simple. We're really simplifying what the workflow looks like for the user to search and find this information and then just literally get it into their project uh, all in one step. So pretty excited about that. If you haven't uh, seen that, and want to start to take advantage of it, sit in on one of the upcoming webinars that we'll be sending the emails out about. And um, we, we're actually got that in a state where you can start testing it yourself. The other thing that we've done uh, is we've added these, uh, uh, started introducing these connectors. So what's different about what we call these, what we call our own direct connectors. So I'm going to show you OneDrive and Google Drive here. This is not, uh, pulling information from the file system. So it's not using one Microsoft's connector to make that, that SMB protocol that I was talking about. We're actually here connected directly via the APIs, Microsoft API directly to my OneDrive account. So these images that you're seeing here, and I've got some PDF files, we're not a OneDrive shop here, so that's why I don't have tons of content in, but um, these are actually living in the cloud file system. So when we, um, you know, when we are, are touching this and you're seeing these previews, uh, there's more, it's from uh, Inkscape, um, from one of the uh, trade shows in the last few years, but um, we're actually pulling that directly out of OneDrive. So here's an example, this is a PDF document. This didn't have to get synchronized to the local file system through the OneDrive or, you know, connect connector to your to your desktop connector. We're actually pulling this directly from OneDrive because we've made a direct connect to that data. So here you can see you can even preview things like PDF documents. But if I go back out here and go, we, we actually were a Google shop. So I'll show you what's kind of cool about this. So uh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going into a channel uh, where I've got Google Drive information. I am going to do a search for something like Harvest that we're working on. So this is all searchable, just like it would be if I'd opened up, you know, my Chrome tab and gone to, you know, my Google Drive. So here are all of these documents. It's all searchable. So I'm just going to give you an example. What's really cool about this is because all of these web cloud hosted technologies are usually cloud enabled. Uh, you know, or browser enabled, you can see here that this is actually a live, I am actually open up my preview inside of Avail. This is a live document that I can edit. And in fact, I'll pop this up here just so I can show you. If I am, I'm gonna pop, I'm gonna pull this over just so you can understand. Here I am, right, through a web browser in that very same document. Well, if I, let's see if I can put these side by side so you can see it, what you're gonna see is, that this is in real time, right? So live connection to all this data. So we're baby stepping our way into, um, into how we can connect to this data. You're gonna see us, we've already been working on a BIM 360 connector that can be live connected to that data. So it's all part of this strategy or, or you know, really philosophy that we have, which is 
you're going to have information more and more in lots of different places. Well, we're now, our task, our goal is that we can avail, can touch that data and you can start to bring that into one interface for your users to be able to search, find, and drive these kinds of workflows around what's going on with all this information. So uh, pretty exciting um, uh, capabilities, right? That uh, this, and so we've, we've turned on this OneDrive and Google Drive connectors as part of this preview release that we've got, that, we've, that we're putting in customers' hands as part of this harvest um, initiative. And it's just starting to elicit some feedback about what you wanna do with it, how you wanna do it, um, how useful this might be, and it, it's helping us kind of set the direction in this thing. So, any questions there, Todd? Yeah, we had a question come in, uh, maybe an insightful one here. Will Harvest replace um, many tasks uh, that the uh, in app, uh, the Revit avail browser currently handles? Yeah, the, go the, goal is, the goal is to rather than, you know, so we've supported, let me state it like this. We've supported in the avail browser for Revit being able to, when you have an RVT file indexed in avail in the context of Revit in the browser, open that RVT and expose the information and data that you have in there. This next step that we're doing with Harvest is the idea that I, what I really want is all of that information that was in the file to look like individual files in avail. So not just be one RVT file, and opening it up in the browser and seeing the details of it, but literally publishing this out so that at your choosing, whichever elements you wanna expose in avail, they'll look like they're individual files, but behind the scenes are really coming out of that one central file. So it's, it's really a progression of steps. And what's been striking about it for me uh, over the last couple of months, right, as we made progress on this was, I think it'll really simplify for the end users, which has always been part of our mission as well, what it means to search, find, and then actually interact with that file. So basically because we can now drag and drop directly either out of the desktop or that browser inside of Revit, everything in Revit, every element in Revit, right? Element is what Autodesk calls the lowest level of things in a Revit file. So a family's an element, a line's an element, a sheet's an element, a drafting view's an element. So we're supporting as many of these elements, right, that make sense. And you can now decide to publish those out and the users can just literally drag and drop to get that or one button click to get it loaded into their project. So we, we really got a sense in the last couple of months that this could dramatically simplify the complexity that there's always been because th some things are families and other things aren't, lots of things aren't families and you've always had two different workflows to try to get that information in there and try to pluck that information out of those RVTs. So that's really where we're concentrated with this initiative. Uh, so, you know, this question's coming is when, when will that uh, Harvest 2.0 be available? It will be available when our current preview release customers tell us it's ready. So we've, we, we got it to the point where it was actually kind of working and, you know, usable. Uh, there's, there was still a few things that uh, we knew we needed to finish. Some of that was like, what kind of tags and information do you wanna come in on this? So that's been in some of our customers' hands the last two weeks and they're starting, we're doing live uh, feedback sessions every Thursday. So our goal is to actually get that completed this month. So we're trying to really accelerate the dev debug cycle with our customers giving this, this feedback. Traditionally, software companies will go work on all this kind of blindly and then think that we've got it done and then release it to customers and then only to find customers tell you, oh, it needs to do this. I wish it did that. And here's what would be really helpful. We take a little bit different approach. We try to get kind of the basics of it done, put it in your hands, and then try to use that as a really tight uh, uh, feedback loop to get the, the what's useful. So. I think we'll have that ready in March um, is the answer. So. All right, we're right on top of the hour. Thanks everybody uh, for sitting in on this. Hopefully, um, hopefully uh, you got excited by what you saw. If you haven't already been using stream or if you are using stream and haven't thought about using it in some new ways, 
hopefully gave you some new uh, uh, new things to think about on that front. We really do think that it's a really important piece of the puzzle is to automate as much of this as possible. It, it definitely will help uh, make sure that you, you've got, your system has all the information in it that, that needs to be in there as automated as possible. And then uh, ending here with a couple of these, uh, you know, kind of previews and some other things, right? We got a lot of a lot of people work on on several fronts trying to keep all of this stuff moving as quickly as we can. So, Todd, another question came in there. We ready to wrap? Uh, uh, yeah, just a um, couple, just you know, thanks and yeah for enterprise customers. If you want to be involved in the preview, absolutely, just reach out to us at support at avail get uh, at getavail .com. I'll make sure to get you, you the info. Um, there was one question of clarification, just that the families there, um, excuse me, the system family, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I'm reading this correctly. Um, each of system attribute one, right. Everything that Harvest 2.0 though there was showing is coming from one source file. So yeah. One, one or more, so you don't have to have them all in one, but yeah. that's the idea is that, it, that all of that info is coming out of an RBT file, not, each individual one saved out individually, even though we do support that as well. There's there's some cloud hosting challenges that, that that may drive the need or want to at least distribute. But the goal is for the BIM manager or the person managing the libraries to manage one central file and then for avail to have tools that as much as possible automates the looking to the end users like those are individual elements and, um, and being able to use them. So. And we'll be sending the recording of this out um, before the end of the week. So, Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody, for joining. We'll uh, call that a wrap and uh, hope to see and talk to you all, all of you soon. Thanks.